I, uh, I was asked to give a bit of a, a talk about uh, focusing today, try and give you some of my, some of the things I've picked up over the years, but if anyone's, if anyone's interested in uh, sort of putting in there a little bit, that's, that's fine. I would like to point out one thing, I do do mono imaging, but you don't have to be smart. Yes, and the It does take a bit of thinking and it does take a bit of time, but I think anyone could do it with a bit of with a bit of practice. Now, one of the things I suppose with focusing is trying to get a feel. Mine doesn't have any flash images until until the end. I might show you a few. But one of the things about focusing is that it's it's one of those things that people. Before, before they actually start, you sort of, well, certainly with me, I didn't know it was going to be as hard to focus properly. Now, one of the things is when I started, I started with film, and the best that we could do was take some images, and you're looking for a little eyepiece uh, or looking for the back of the camera, and you try to tweak something and you try to get it as good and then you send them off to be developed and then they come back and then you think, well, shit, that I was well out. Maybe I could have it. You know, it was, it was really one of those things. So the idea with focusing is to try to say, well, I don't want to have to fluke it every time. I want to sort of have a way of improving it. Now, try to understand what focusing is really because it's not as straightforward as you might you might say because it's basically taking the light from an object and putting it in one spot if it comes from a spot putting it on a spot on a, on a detector so that it actually reflects what is up in the sky but of course there's a lot of stuff that goes on the the light doesn't all come in in the one direction you get it's slightly off the off the thing and it comes at different angles and the focus can change a bit but the whole point is what we want to do is we want to hold a detector but we want before we even hold a detector in the right spot we want things to be as sharp as possible now the next idea is just showing it I'm, I'm, I'm going through some basics here and hopefully it won't be too boring for people but as we come in, we, the light that comes into your telescope, or whatever, ends up hopefully at one point. The ones that come from the middle end up here, and everything from that that's coming in straight ends up at the same spot. And the ratio of how wide your, your actual detect, uh, sorry, the objective or, or begin, the front of your telescope is, or the mirror, and how long it takes before all those rays of light come to a point. Is, is the ratio of that is what we talk about when we're talking about a focal ratio. And one of the things that you actually find with these things is that it makes a difference because the shorter focal ratios, where they come together very quickly, they give you a much wider area of light that's coming in. Whereas if you have a very long focal length and it's a low ratio, you're looking at a much narrower area. We'll just come back to that in a minute. One of the things that we have to deal with, and if I'm going too far, to one of the things we have to deal with is often with things like lenses. When the light goes through a piece of glass, different light ends up coming to different spots. If what like the red will be here, the green there, it's sort of rough, but obviously, if we were taking a picture through a normal camera lens and it was ending up like that with our RGBs and everything we'd, we'd do our best, we'd probably end up taking a picture with the green in focus and the red a bit out or you choose whatever would be the most important thing. You can avoid a little bit of this by using mirrors but at some point there's going to be some lenses more than likely in the, in the train. So <coughs> the first thing that, that was developed years ago I don't know, probably 150 years ago, was people got together and they worked out that by combining different types of glasses, you could end up with an improvement. It's, it may look perfect here, but in the real world, it, there's lots of other little factors. But you can definitely get things by combining glasses. And what you do find is that 
if you're using, as most people end up using refractors at, at some point or another, whether it's with camera lenses or, or with actual refracting telescopes, that there comes a point where the more expensive and the better designed lenses and things will produce a better image. Sometimes it won't make much difference, but when you're talking about stars, it can make all the difference. And uh, just to point out there that the same principle that happens with lenses, <coughs> instead of light coming in, the idea is it reflects off a thing like that and you get the light coming to a point. The, so it's a bit hard finding images that actually describe this, but okay, so there's a certain thing with when you use things like a parabolic mirror, the whole idea is that things that come in parallel will all come to the same point. Okay. Now, going back to the old days, when I used to have to focus with pentaprisms and things like that, what would happen is the light would all be coming in and what you want to do is you want everything to be focused at this point. But of course, especially with a lot of things in the past, if you were looking for a little eyepiece, you weren't actually looking from that point, you were looking up here. So there had to be all these adjustments so that when things were in focus, when they were coming through this extra long path, that it would match what would happen at this point. I don't know, it may seem a bit obvious, but people might not realise that obviously the light takes a lot longer to get to here. So there has to be adjustments in this process to say, oh, well, this is the equivalent of if the light travelled from there to here. And that's often what ends up being a bit of a problem with all these things. Now, coming back to the, to the focal ratio, where you've got a wider or a narrow thing, one of the things that you end up with is that if you stop down, you have a, like a, a simple, this is making it simple, but often if things don't actually come together and don't get focused quite the way you want them, by, ex by actually stopping down and narrow and narrow, you can actually improve the focus. It actually, what it actually ends up doing is it says, well, the 200 mil or 500 mil or whatever focal length stays the same, but you have, you're effectively making the focal ratio longer. And one of the things about making the focal ratio longer is it gets a bit easier to focus. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So, if you've ever had a cheap telescope, like in a department store, and you pull them apart, and I'll have actually done some of this stuff, <laughs> you'll often see that it may advertise, I don't know, 50 mil. But when you actually look inside and you measure it all and everything, it's actually not 50 mil. The main objective might be, but they put all these stops inside it to basically get rid of all the imperfections of the outside of the lens and to make it into a longer focal length, effectively a longer focal ratio, sorry, to try and improve the image. Okay. Now there's one other way with lenses to try and improve the image that and I, I actually, when I do all this, I probably should have reordered it a little bit. But another way that you can improve, when you've got things coming together at different spots, you can actually, as we were just discussing with narrow bands, you can actually put narrow band filters. Is this what they actually look like in the one that you had, similar to that? It goes um, into a digital SLR. That's, that's the one that's a different shape. Sort of different yeah. shape. But the principle is that you can actually, you can, even though you're using it to get more contrast, it can actually help with focusing because you're only you're only trying to focus one narrow bit of light mm. and that's also an advantage with a, lo a lot of it as well mm. you probably didn't think of it that way mm. because <laughs> most people use they think of narrow band as being oh you know i'm getting rid of all the light i don't want but in some ways it can actually improve the focus because it's that way. now one of the, th this is where, it, this is where the optics comes into play. When you, when you have uh, any optical system, 
the basic optical system when it when it puts light in into a focused position and light comes from different angles which it will as you spread away from the center you actually don't get all the light focusing at the same distance from the middle or from there it actually becomes a curved arrangement where the focus is now unfortunately CCD detectors are not curved. <laughs> it may seem a rather obvious thing, but the whole point is you want, the bigger your detector this becomes more of an issue, you want as much of a what you're detecting to be in focus. You don't just want the little bit in the middle. If you've ever used a telescope with your eye, you'll find that um, it's in the centre, in some cases, it can be really sharp, and as it gets away, it can be a little bit iffy on the edge. But of course, with your eye, you can move it around, you can do all sorts of things with it. It's really quite an adaptable detector. It's not as challenging. Even CCDs that are tiny today, like a centimetre across, you know, they still have a fairly large field of view compared with your eye. So the next thing that that comes about with is that when you're actually trying to focus, you'll get the CCD chip there, and you'll get various points which won't be in focus as much. So you might think, oh, yeah, this isn't going to go anywhere. We're never going to get the whole thing. In. But there are solutions to this. But some are better than others. But the thing is, what you've got to bear in mind is that when, you, when it comes right down to it, now this is a bit of a hard thing to try and explain, but they're trying to show you with this image how a star looks to a detector as you get further away from the from the centre of the axis. So is that why we have things called flatness and stuff? Like that? Yes, that's why you do. Because if if you follow the curvature, like the actual curved part, your star would look like that. And of course, because you're flat, the star starts looking like each of those. Yes. Now, detectors today in CCD cameras are fairly big, relative to what they used to be. But they're small compared to the top, well, some types of old film, but anyway. But we're much, we're much fussier these days. And one of the things that comes into all of this is that there's, there's a thing where with any particular ray of light coming in there's a certain area which is where the star image is the, the, the detector or, and, and the actual the optics of the thing will, will produce an image that big so even if theoretically the cone of light will converge to there there's an actual range with any focusing situation. There's a range where effectively you could be in any of these spots and the detector will see it as focused. These, are, these can be really quite tiny, but they can actually be sig significantly. The longer the longer the focal ratio, the, what's it, the longer the focal ratio, like an F10 telescope, where it's ten times longer than the diameter of the objective is a lot easier to focus because this is coming in at a lower angle. If you can imagine that, if that was extended to here and it focused here, the angle that is, this little area comes in, you're going to get a lot much longer range of where you can actually be in focus. Whereas if you've got something like a theoretical F, like an F1 telescope, and there are very few of them around, but if the, if the angle of the light's coming in like that, sort of coming, it's hitting it the actual area that it's going to be in focus is going to be very, very narrow. And effectively, there's some measurements that you can, that people have worked out. I've actually taken this out of a, a site on the internet. Working out, if you went from an F1 ratio to a telescope to an F16, how much depth of Good. focus you can allow and still be in focus. And these are microns, which is a thousandth of a millimetre. So 
if you were using an F-16 telescope, you'd be in focus, you've got almost a millimetre of play. And you probably think, oh, a millimetre's... it's not much. I mean, most people would think a millimetre's not a lot. <laughs> and that's less than a millimetre, right? But if you had some F1, F1.4, even F2, it's an enormous amount of difference, like even F4, it's 50. You compare that with an F16 or an F10, it's a lot smaller. And most telescope, most imaging is done somewhere between F10 and probably about F3. It's, it's, well, I don't know if somebody's got anything faster than that. F2.8 maybe. But even between an F2.8, F4, you start, and as you get longer focal lengths, what, what it means is effectively that you can be a little bit more relaxed about you, you're going to find it in some ways you're going to find it harder to focus because you can move it you can move it in and out and it probably won't show up any different whereas if you did the same thing here if i move let's use f4 <coughs> as an example i could move that fifty thousandth of a millimeter and it would be in focus or out of focus or possibly even half that because you're only sort of moving in sort of an area if I move that same distance with something like this, I might not even notice it. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that if focusing is a concern, well, it's going to be less concern if you're using a longer focal length system. And if anyone's, I'm sure there's a few people here have done the odd bit of astrophotography on the moon, and high definition on the planets and all that, and you use really long effectively focal lengths, I don't know what they end up being, F40, F, F, something like that. I don't know, I find them, the, 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 it's not the focusing that's the difficult thing when you do there, it's the atmosphere that becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Focusing is hard. Mm -hmm. You can, you can think you're in focus one second, the next second you're out of focus, the next second you're in, you're out, you're in. You're <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like a, I don't know, it's like looking at the sun or the moon or anything from the bottom of a pool and it's just moving around all over the place. It's quite fascinating when you watch a video of the planets in, in, uh, in long focal length, how it's all jumping around. But, but effectively, the problem's not focal. It's not focusing then. The problem's, well, how do I get around all this rippling? So, that's what you've got. Now, it comes, so, you've got a detector on your scope and you've got to work out, well, how do I try and adjust it so I can get these sorts of accuracies? Now, there's two common methods of uh, focusing. I think most people are familiar with the, the most common method is you've got a camera on the back of your scope and you've got a little adjustment or you've got something electric and the camera's just being moved back and forward. But if you've, if you've got a uh, Schmidt Cassegrain or any of the Cassegrain type telescopes, they don't normally focus by moving the camera. They normally focus by moving the lens, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the main mirror. And this is a bit of a drawing, but effectively what happens here, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, but you've got a little knob maybe there, and it's got a little thing, and as you turn it, it effectively moves this thing, and the whole mirror moves back and forward. And uh, so you can, in here with a knife, if you stick a, a, a camera there, the camera just solidly stays in one spot. But, I don't know about you, but to me, moving a whole mirror has <coughs> a whole lot of things that can happen. Because as you move the mirror on this side, you're actually putting a bit of sideward pressure on the, the whole arrangement, and you can get mirror shift, you can get all sorts of things. So It's not as precise, but the way we are. Now, when it comes to focusing, there's a whole lot of techniques that you can use. And uh, I suppose the easiest thing is like, you, is focusing by eye. You get in there, you get, uh, it's like when you, you're in the, uh, you're looking at a star or you're looking at some object in the sky and you're just moving your hand and watching how it all moves. But if you're doing this with photography, you, you have, and can I put it? In the days before, you had screens on the back that you could monitor, and you were looking for a, a viewfinder. 
uh, I don't think they have them now, but you used to have a thing like on the focusing screen where you have a little circle with two little things and they sort of effectively you'd see the thing move up and down and you try to align them. Well, that worked fine during the day. <laughs> that was hopeless during the night. <laughs> Might have worked on the moon, but it's uh, so. The one thing about focusing by eye is I wanted to point out all these things that happen. Your, your eyes, it's not a very accurate method. It can be get you close, you can't repeat it. The eye gets tired, the more it, longer it tries to focus on something, it gets tired. We left out alcohol. Alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> I have actually. Uh, well, that help or hindrance? <laughs> it's funny you should say that because I, I was actually, uh, I had some people over years ago when Halley's Comet was around. And we were having a bit of a social occasion, I was having a few drinks, and I was out there after trying to focus on the telescope, and I was realising I was having a lot more trouble than I was. <laughs> <laughs> after that, I sort of thought, oh, give up alcohol and, and uh, astrophotography. But, you know, I wasn't even trying to do that. Good thing is that your eyes generally low cost, unless you've got old glasses and things like me, but it starts increasing. So, Focusing by eye was the simplest thing to do, low percentage of success. So we put these attachments on, and you can still do it on a lot of digital SLRs, which magnify the image and they can put it at a better angle than trying to get under a under an eyepiece and try to be uncomfortable. <coughs> they have problems. They're relatively low cost, but they can still be a couple of hundred bucks. <coughs> they produce a very dim image. The image in the back of your camera is very dim to start with. Mm -hmm. So, I would suggest if you were ever tempted to get one of these things, I would probably not bother, unless it was the moon or something like that might help you do a bit better. These days, you've, you've probably got the, the option, which is what most people have, where you can actually take photos, where you can see the image on the back of your camera. Um, it's still... It's still a problem when, you, when you're trying to photograph something. These, this isn't going to be the full scale. It's, it's going to be, you, you've still got to adjust it. You've still got to get, the eye has got to be, it's got to be making a judgment or I think I'm in focus or that one. Maybe, um, it's probably the best way. It's a lot easier than it used to be. It's, it's available on most digital SLRs these days, um, even point-and-shoot cameras, um, even phones, if you're, <laughs> if you're taking a photo through a phone, you can generally look at what's there and you can, and you can make a judgment. So it's, it's an option. Um, you, you usually find that with, with most things in astrophotography, the first time you get a result, you're happy with it. But the second time, if you get the same result, you're not quite as happy. <laughs> <laughs> the third or fourth time, you get a more unhappy as time goes on. You just, because you want to see, you, you know what's possible because you look around you and you see people who've got images that are fantastic. And although you're happy to start with, you want to improve. So the whole point is with focusing, you want to improve. But you don't want to improve randomly. You just want, you want, you want something that's repeatable, that's fairly quick, is hopefully, I think, and something that you can rely on. Um, one of the solutions that's, um, that people sometimes use is the Hartman mask. I think it's actually got a more technical name. The Hartman is only one variation of it. Barton. Barton. Now, the Barton off's different. Different. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's a different. That comes up next. Okay. This was the original way. What would happen is if, you're, if you, you put a cover on the you can put them on the front of your telescope or on camera lenses and all that. A couple of holes in there. So you effectively have two telescopes <laughs> if, if you look at them separately. Um, and the whole idea is that if, when you're in focus, you get, well, and when you're out of focus, you get dots that are the same star appears twice in your image. And you take an image and you have a look at, oh, okay, that's a bit out. I'll take another one. Or if you've got a video, you can adjust it. You keep adjusting it until all the images come together. And hopefully you get something like that. But it's still a method that's dependent on user judgment. Because well, at what point do these stars come together to be exactly? 
one of the things that it also does is imagine that if you've got a like a lens that's that big, you've now made two really small lenses. So what's that going to do with the brightness of your image? It's going to mm -hmm. reduce it down. So it means that it's going to be harder. Whatever's in there is going to be nowhere near as bright. So it works. It's pretty low cost. You can make it out of a bit of cardboard and and. Uh, I don't know, I find these things a bit frustrating, but they do work. They're not perfect. And they give you some, they give you an improvement on not doing it. <coughs> I, I believe they do. I don't know if anyone else has had any experience, but I think in the long term, you, the, the dis disadvantages sort of outweigh that. But they are pretty cheap. Now, another thing that's become pretty popular lately is the Bartlett mask. Similar type of thing. But instead of, um, this is, if you, if you think of the amount of light getting through two little small holes, well, this is letting a whole lot more light in. If you put that over the end of a, of a telescope or, or a camera lens, you're letting in probably, I don't know, 40, 30 percent, whereas the other one might have let in 10 percent. Yeah. So you get, you are going to get a brighter image. The technique's quite different. You get effectively three lines. And the whole point is you've got two there and you've got another one that as you get in and out of focus it sort of moves across them. So that middle one is you, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get it. So can, can you, you see it? Yes, look at that. Can you point the one that's meant to be moving? I can't quite see the... This is, this is the vertical, uh, well I call it the vertical, it's the one that moves, the vertical one. So oh, okay. the longest one, isn't it? Uh, the longest, uh, yeah, longest one. Probably, <laughs> it's probably there or what? 10 o'clock to 4 Yeah, so the idea is in this one if you, where these two cross, this vertical bar is to the left, if you want to call it that. Here, so it means it's not quite in focus. Here it's to the right of, oh, yeah, of, that, yeah, yeah. of that centre point. See it now, yeah. And here it's centred. But even then, oh, I've got one of these and, and I did have a go at it once. I found it was, it's really quite <laughs> hard to tell where the centre is. <laughs> it's a bit like when you're merging two dots. Where's the, where are they really merged in the thing? And this is like, I don't know, it's brighter, but it's, where is that centre point? When you're trying to adjust something, it's, it sounds good. I'm going to use one. I, I read, yeah. but, uh, but through the laptop, yep. so I'm viewing it through the laptop. Okay, so you and I are actually looking at it through your eye, but you're looking at it on the screen. Yeah, right? I can get pretty... So it's actually quite, probably quite big. I can get it big, yeah, yeah and mm. I, I find it... Um, pretty accurate yeah. Yeah. but you're still using a bit of judgment yeah, yeah. but mm -hmm. if, you it's done properly, if it's done properly done properly you can you can produce a good result uh, I'm just trying to point out that there yeah. are some disadvantages and these things can work and some people can probably go all their astronomical life and not yeah. and not have any too many failures I think it'll get you in the ballpark if you're using a long focal length again if you're doing planetary stuff though, you're going to have a long focal ratio, so, and, uh, so the, the chances are that it's not going to be the critical part of, of what you're doing. It'll get you within the range and then <coughs> once you're there it'll be okay. Yeah, I've used one of those back up and got some good results with it, but the issue is that as you go longer into the night you've got to refocus and, and that's not that's not well, that option really. Yeah, that's, that, that can happen. Yeah. And again, that depends on your focal ratio. Your telescope's an active thing. I think I've got something coming up about that, but we'll go. come back to that. Can you can interrupt, don't worry. So then one of the other things is that you can do is, uh, with mo if it's a camera and you've got an automatic focus camera lens, you can actually, you can use the autofocus. But I've, I don't know if anyone's ever successfully used autofocus on stars. On, don't know that they actually will do much with that. It'll work okay if you've got the moon, or if you're doing some solar stuff, it might work okay. But I'm not sure that you would do that for a camera lens anyway. But Actually, I had, um, I was down at Great Ocean Road a few weeks back with a few guys, and we were shooting at night. And um, it was a nightmare to try and pick up a focus, and they were using torches and trying to do short stuff which didn't gel with anything I understood. What, what were they trying to focus on? 
something about 50 feet or 50 meters away yeah. right and then sort of use the depth of field but that was, was it, too much yeah, it was, uh, too, it was, was all out of focus and um, when you blew it up and in the end it was it was a well moonlit night we ended up shoot, uh, focusing on the moon we couldn't focus on anything but the moon yeah we tried a couple of different things as well well the one thing about autofocus lens is it's a bit of a problem is that first of all they they can they can really they need some sharp edge generally to sure. to focus on i don't think they lock very well if they have a locking function so i don't think all of them have lock uh, an ability to say on now and focus hold that well, it depends on how you got your camera set up but yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not convinced that there's too much. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's, that's, what doing that. that's oh, my yeah. main experience with trying yeah. to do it. If I've got the moon and it covers, say, 50% or more, mm. I've done. I, I've never had a problem. But that's a long focal length to have on a camera lens anyway. So, and when it gets faint, which is what your problem is at night. The autofocus routines just give up the ghost yeah. most of the time. Now, there's a couple of other techniques that people have used in the past that sometimes work. It's a thing called par focalizing your eyepieces, where you can actually um, you take what take your camera off and you can put something onto the end of the um, onto, onto the end of the scope, and you can use an eyepiece thing and you can adjust. And you, as long as you've got the the focus position of that worked out so it's going to be the same as if you take that off and put the camera on, they can work quite well. I'm only I'm giving you this information for historical use only, I think, because most of the companies, and there were very few anyway, that made these sorts of things have gone out of business from what I could see looking up recently. The thing is still available, the thing called the knife edge focus, and this simplifying a little bit but effectively you can have like a sharp thing that gets into the, the plane of where the CCD will go or the CMOS detector and you put this knife edge and if you imagine a star if it's a if it's a star it's a tiny tiny spot of light a cone of light if it's coming to an exact point at that edge then you, you move the <coughs> edge just slightly It'll disappear. You move it back slightly, it'll come back into focus, uh, it'll come back visible. And if it happens instantaneously, it means you're in focus. Because if you have your, your knife edge up here, when it's not, you can move it a fair bit before it'll disappear or not. So the idea is a knife edge focus, and it can, and it can work. And it's, it's, as long as the, the position of that knife is exactly the same position as the CCD, it can work pretty well. I'm a little nervous about my <laughs> and I in the same sentence. <laughs> in, in the dark. And, sen <laughs> and <laughs> sense. <laughs> and sense that as well. <laughs> I'm life in a sense. <laughs> Let's look at this again, but this time make it really thick. Instead of having it at a point, it'll still work the same way because you're only really interested in the point up here. It doesn't have to be a sharp edge. I think traditionally they tended to be, but, and it's called a knife edge, I assume, because they use knives to do it, but I don't know, blades or something. Or there'd be somebody out there, and you want to pay enough for it. Live view, this seems, seems to be the most popular way with digital SLRs these days. I think nearly all of them with CMOS detectors will have a live view option. It's still, it still depends a lot on your your judgment, your vision, you know, what you're looking at on screen. You're not seeing it at star size, the exact you're not seeing it pixel by pixel, so you've still got problems with it. But they, they seem to be the easiest way. I've seen some pretty good results. I've also I, I do I will admit I have seen some some of these videos particularly that are made where I think they could have been focused better. So people that are using them so there's some bit of hit and miss there still, and I think anyone who ever spends a few hours, well, you actually end up spending a whole night, don't you? And you end up, by the time you're packed up, and you end up long, a whole day is taken up just for one night. Uh, you don't want to get back and find that 
I wasn't quite focused as well as I could have been. I thought go through it all again next time. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, you, you do. So, probably, and this is where most people end up, I believe, is there's a thing called software, it's been characterised as software metrics. When you look, when you're looking at a star, and you see it on, you you actually you have your detector, and your detector has takes an image, and you can choose a star in the field. It's a bit hard to actually show this, and, you know. Uh, it's better to be demonstrated to. And you can choose, I want that star, and you choose a star that's not like it's not going to be over, like if it's. You don't want it to be saturated, you just want a star that's sort of in the middle of the range. And you can get the software will produce a curve. I don't know if they all do it exactly like this, but I think there's a similarity. They look at that star and they analyse it for brightness level around a dot, sort of like you take a little square and you work out all the percentages, you can work out how much of that light and the maximum amount, and it produces a curve like that. <coughs> And what you end up doing is you take another picture and you can work out things like a full width, half maximum. So it sort of takes the maximum brightness of that star, divides it in two, and works out how wide that is. And the idea is the sharper the star is, the more that goes up. So you're trying to reduce that to... So there's two ways of doing it. You can reduce this to its minimum by making some weeks or you can look at the maximum and and uh, and just say well it's going up so so if it was 25,000 there the next shot was 30,000 you know you're going in the right direction if it becomes 16,000 you know you're going in the wrong direction the only thing is if, even if you took two images sort of immediately one after the other and you didn't touch your scope at all it's very unlikely you get the same figure each time. Because the atmosphere is up there and it's twinkling around and doing all sorts of things with the, uh, the scope. So each time you get one of these images through, it's probably going to give you a different result. So there's still, even with all of this, you think, oh, you, know, you do everything you can, you think, I'm getting... This will give you, you just, you just let it go for a while and you can see whether you're tweaking it in the right direction. And this is the method I use for the... Uh, but this requires you, I think, the only way you could really do this is to have a, a, a computer attached to your, to your camera and to be taking out images and that and analysing it. I don't think there's any other way that you can do it without a computer. Whereas a lot of the other methods allow you to do it with a digital SLR or some other thing where you don't actually need a computer. But if you go into cool cameras like me and you don't have a digital SLR to store it, you've got to have a computer anyway. So my, my camera wouldn't even work without a computer. <laughs> so long gone are the days when I just stuck a camera on it, made sure I had a couple of batteries in it and just hoped for the best. Now that's all very well. You've, you've actually... Uh, You've got different methods to try and improve your focus, but when it comes right down to it, and I, there's one thing I have missed, there's a number of different types of focuses. Now, I did actually miss one, but I, I, you, you know, when you go back over something and you realise it, it's a bit like, <coughs> oh, that was what I missed, I knew it was something. Probably the longest um, way of the, the, the method has been away around the longest in telescopes to focus is a rack and pinion focuser, which is basically you've got a little thing on the side that moves something, there's a couple of cogs in there and one moves out and it physically moves the camera. Um, they're the cheapest method of actually focusing. Um, just basically you can do, there's two different things, but essentially you just, you just adjust it. You can do it by hand or you can have little motorised battery things. Um, as I mentioned before, you've got primary mirrors that move. One of the examples of it, which is instead of having cogs, they actually have like a like a, a rod and, and the rod moves. So there's as cogs fit together, there's always a bit of looseness. It's just one of the principles. If you tighten them up too much, you won't be able to move them. 
And with the creative focus, you've got precision. A really very effective focuser. And if they're well made, they're, they're probably, I don't know if they're the ultimate, but I think they're probably as close to the ultimate as you can get. They often have a little adjustment knob on them at the bottom that allows you to adjust the tightness of how much it's pushing. They can have ratios where you can have different ratios so you can have a lot of precision or do a quick move. And I think they're probably the, uh, if you can afford it, they're, the, they're a good way of doing it, but the other methods also work. All, all, all focuses, I think just about all focuses can be motorised. You have various things where you can put these on the end of a focuser knob and tie them down, or you can attach them to some part of your telescope. You've got others where you've got actual motors that fit on, and you've got controllers that come with them. I, myself, I pretty well only do focusing with either electric or, and I don't use computer, but you can actually control these things from a computer screen. And do auto focusing. The, uh, I got very frustrated when I used to do it because if you physically go over to your telescope and you move the focuser, unless you're really good, you will move the whole telescope, now, even a slight bit, and you then have to wait for it to sort of calm down a bit. It's worse at long focal lengths, but also the other thing is if you ever try moving a focuser just, just a fraction, I mean a really small amount, and you have these, like on these ones, you've got these 10 to 1 ratio, like you can move that, doesn't move it as much, but even then, even with all of those, when, if you've got very fast focal length systems, you want to have a situation where you can control it. Now, your hand controlling a, a moving a, an object is not a precision instrument. It can portray a couple of messages quite clearly, but it's not precision. <laughs> it's brute force. So the other thing is, by having motorised focuses, you avoid two things. First of all, you have more precise control over it. Secondly, you're not touching the telescope, so you're not moving the object. You're not introducing vibration. And one other thing that um, I didn't really cover before was that uh, when you've got a telescope that's focused. It may not stay focused. Now you might think, oh, why wouldn't it stay focused? Well, you might start observing and it's 30 degrees, as happens in uh, summer. By the time you've got, got it 11 o'clock at night or 12 o'clock, it might be 20 degrees. The temperature has changed. What does that mean? Well, usually when the temperature changes, your telescope focus point is moved. Yeah, it's probably, you can get around that because if you were pointing out before, you may have to refocus multiple times during the night if that's what you do. Again, the focal ratios as they get F4s, F2.8s, they get harder, so they're going to be more impacted. If you do F10, you're probably going to have less of a problem. But you can get around that, and I haven't got one of these, and there's not too many people with them, but you can get focusing which actually adjusts for the temperature, the ambient temperature. And they can have built-in things. Yeah. These actually do it as well, but, but you have a whole unit that's built in, it's got a detector temperature and everything. And you can start off your night and you can say, once it's calibrated, you've got to have all this effort to calibrate it, you can actually say confidently, and I think one of our members, Steve, does a lot of this sort of stuff. Once he's going, he's got electronics and computers and programs working out what the temperature is and the focus position, and you can adjust it with different filters so that he puts filters and everything's automated, and so you can do all that. And just pointing out, I had a couple of examples here, and I will show you a few images in a minute just to make it a bit more interesting. This was an example I picked up off of the internet about a focus with somebody who's tried to focus, and then they taken the same thing and they've improved it just by so an image like that you can see it's, it doesn't look quite as good up there it's not as clear but by jumping back and forward the chain, you can see just a small amount of difference and it would bring out a lot of faint stars just that difference between being in focus and being out of focus just a little bit 
can be the difference between seeing faint stars or faint nebulosity. Just that small amount. You might not think it's important, but you want to get the best out of your optical system as you can. And you can look at these things and you can say, well, you know, now I've got some examples, I'll, I'll actually just go into them in a minute. That's the basics of what I was going to cover with focusing. So hopefully that can sit. I'll give you a couple of images in just a moment. I like that one. Sorry? It's nice that one, it twinkles. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't actually describe it. I'll just show you a few things. So give me a moment to... Yeah. 